My name's Sasha Pete, and I'm joined by a fantastic individual, a legend of our game, and this man represented us in our very first World Cup in 1974, the legendary Colin John Curran. Welcome, Col. Welcome, Sasha. Good afternoon. It's, um, it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you, sir. And um, I hope all the viewers uh, enjoy our conversation uh, today. But first up, uh, Cole, um, you've got a nickname. You want to tell everybody what your nickname is, mate? Yeah, well, uh, I, get, I get named that more than I get me named Colin. Uh, my nickname is Bunny. Uh, and I get called by all of my uh, relatives and mates and Friends and even not so friends. So, uh, yeah, that's my nickname, Bunny. Bunny, and I, they, even a, they even have a they even have a Bunny Curran Bunny Curran medal uh, yes. in the Northern New South Wales Soccer Federation for uh, pre-season matches. Okay. Tournament, yes. Fantastic. How'd you get the name Bunny? Well, I started playing soccer when I was six year old and. Back in those days, they never had any under eights or nines, or they started at under tens. And uh, the the under tens always used to be short, so they used to throw me in just to uh, make up the numbers. And I used to uh, be small, as you would know, playing under tens as a six year old. And I used to be a nuisance, more or less, of <laughs> kicking the ball and running through the players' legs and things like that. So I got the nickname as Bunny. That's stuck with me for 73 years. That's fantastic. So uh, it's a great nickname. And uh, you, you grew up in the great Newcastle area, so you're Novocastrian. Um, so uh, back, back in Newcastle, when you were born, you either played one of two sports, right? It was uh, cricket in the summer and football in the, in the winter. Is that right? Yes, yes, because I came from a... Uh, a sort of a soccer town and a cricket town. Yeah. And uh, uh, there wasn't so much rugby league where I grew up, but there was uh, a rugby league town. Uh, Newcastle was a rugby league town, but where I come from was a small town called West Walls End. And they had uh, a soccer teams and cricket teams and no league teams at the time. So mm -hmm. uh, I decided to play soccer and uh, loved playing. And uh, we would play day and night, every spare time we had. If he wasn't in the bush uh, uh, looking for bird's eggs. <laughs> and um, you went to which, uh, which primary school did you go, go to? I went to West Walls End Primary School till I was uh, 12 year old. And uh, then I, uh, we shifted into uh, Newcastle. My okay. father got a job in Newcastle and I went to uh, Broadmeadow Junior High Secondary School after that. And you played football, obviously, all the way through uh, primary school and, and high school. And uh, you had a mate um, playing alongside you. also ended up playing in the, 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 um, the 74, uh, sorry, the lead up to the, the 74 uh, World Cup team. You tell us who your best mate is uh, you grew up with. Oh, my best mate, Raymond Bass. Uh, Raymond Bass was one of the... Uh, great soccer players of Australia. He uh, he was uh, the Timmy Cahill of the the 60s and the 70s. Mm. And uh, we met when we were about nine year old playing uh, representative school uh, soccer for the schools. Yes, and that's how we met. We were about nine year old, and uh, uh, we've been mates ever since. So, uh, and we're very very good friends. How good's that? Two mates from Newcastle that may end up playing uh, Socceroos together. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So uh, cheers to Ray out there. And um, uh, I know uh, you've shared many, many good memories with him. So um, when did you first play uh, first team football? How old were you, uh, Col? I was 14 when I first played football, uh, first grade football. Uh, Myself and Ray Bass went to Maitland, at, uh, which is uh, 20, 20 kilometres uh, from, Mate, from uh, Newcastle. And uh, we had a, a chap wanted us to go up there and uh, uh, play for Maitland. And we both played uh, in the early 60s. Uh, our first 
our first go at uh, state league football, as you call it. And Ray played uh, first grade all year, and I played about eight games first grade for Maitland. Mm. And uh, uh, we only stayed there the year, and the year after we were asked to go to Adamsley and Rosebuds, which we both did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but that's unbelievable. 14 years old playing first grade football. You're still a baby at 14, right? So um, what was it like being 14 and playing against adults, you know, guys two, two heads bigger than you? It was very hard, I know, because it was uh, we were thrown the fire, so to speak, and uh, from the frying pan into the fire, we were playing with older, older players who knew all the tricks and... Uh, Mm. Uh, you all know, you had know, to push you and shove you and mm. and, uh, and that and we soon learned that uh, it was a pretty hard game at the time uh, mm. Mm. when we were that age and I, I, I take it but a, a really good learning experience as well you, when you play first team football at 14 and, and, and then you go across to Adamson and Rosebuds at 15 year old uh, you, you're playing first team football there as well Yes, we, we both played uh, first-team football the first year we were there, but it was good in a way because Adamstown Rosebuds was a, is a very successful club and they had a lot of good players come through their ranks. So a lot of overseas English and Scottish players used to come and play there and, and it was good in a way because they uh, were only young and they were uh, a middle-aged type, type thing and they, they would... Uh, Get you by yourself and and show you the ropes and teach you uh, the the goods and bads of, of football and uh, help you along your way. And if you listen to them, you you, you became all right. Mm, mm, mm. It's a, it sounds like you. Um, it, it's it's nice when you be, when you're a local boy and you play at a local club and you, you stay there for a little while. Um, I'm sure you had many many good memories. You and Ray playing for that club. Um, but it didn't take too long um, before there was, I believe there was some kind of scholarship and um, two of the lads, um, including Ray, uh, ended up getting a scholarship to go over um, and play at Manchester United. Is that right? Yes. Adam Stans got in touch with Manchester and uh, asked could they have a uh, send a couple of kids over couple of boys over each each year to uh, get some coaching and experience and and that you know and uh, I missed out on the first year yep. Ray went with uh, a chap called Dougie Johns and they they went the first year and they said we're only sending two you'll be going next year yep so I was, oh, had me hopes set up on that for the mm. next 12 months as you would think and uh, and when the next 12 months came around they squashed it, mm. and I was very, very upset and uh, put out. So I decided to try and go over myself wow. with a recommendation wow. of of Ray Bart's uh, going to Sir Matt Busby and asking him could one of his mates come over for a trial. And he said, Sir Matt Busby said, "Yes, tell your mate he can come over and stay as long as he likes. He'll be very welcome." So, so the, I decided to decided to uh, get over, go over and yeah. get some, have a couple of money raises from the ladies committee at Adamstown, and of course it was too dear to fly in those days. Mm. Those days, and mm-hmm. so I caught a ship, and it took uh, six weeks to get to Southampton from from Circular Quay. But uh, it was uh, some trip. It was a long time. Yes, and um, you're still a young fella at this age, right? So. Yeah, I was, uh, I turned 16 the day I got to Southampton and it was in August uh, of 1965 and uh, I caught a train to uh, Liverpool where Ray uh, uh, met me, he he, uh, lived at Manchester of course because he was playing there and he drove down to Liverpool and and met me and uh, took me back to his home. Fantastic. And so tell me what it was like when you first, I mean, obviously Ray meets you. He's already spent a, 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 some time there, so he knows the ropes. Um, but you arrive. What was it like walking um, 
into Old Trafford? Oh yeah, well, the the the, uh, the day I got there, it, uh, he said we'll go into uh, Old Trafford in the in the morning because I've got training, of course, and uh, I'll take you to meet some of the the players and uh, the coaching staff. And we we went up we went up the back way of the of Old Trafford and uh, uh, and once they, once you get up to the top and you look out onto the the massive, massive stadium, which held 80, 80 to 90,000 at the time. And, and the, the, uh, it was just like a great big hall with a billiard table in the middle. It was, uh, it was so eye-opening. It was, I yeah, never, never relinquished anything like that before in my life. But now, now there's stadiums like that all over the world. Yes. But uh, yeah. it was a, it was a, uh, an eye-opener for me to, uh, to see that great big stadium. No? Brilliant. Um, so, you um, the, from from memory, the, the um, they had a quality side. Uh, then uh, Bobby Charlton, George Best, uh, just to name two. Um, who did, who did you uh, look to aspire to be like in that side? Well, yes, as you say, they had uh, Bobby Charlton, uh, George Best, Dennis Law. Paddy Carrera and Nobby Styles, like uh, a few of these blokes were were in the World Cup, 1966 World Cup team. And uh, Tony Dunn was a left fullback, which I played left fullback. And uh, at training, they'd uh, sort of take someone under their wing and mm-hmm. give them some instructions. And that's when the the overlapping football uh, fullback come uh, yep. come of come of age, round about. 60, 65, 64, and uh, I like to play that game. So he taught me a lot of things and uh, uh, how to uh, attack and how to get back or get someone to get back for you if you're out of position and all that. And, uh, yeah, that was a wonderful club to be, wonderful atmosphere. The, the players were so good and, uh, you know, you think someone would be uh, playing first grade matches, you wouldn't talk to you, but... We even went out with Georgie Best on a few occasions, yeah. and uh, he was just one of the lads. He was a very nice bloke, and oh, Bobby yeah. Charles, absolutely fantastic sportsman. Uh, and Sir Matt Busby, he was just a great man, you know. And uh, it was uh, an eye opener just to be there, let alone being able to train, train, and then put the shirt on and play in the mm-hmm. in the youth team. It was, yeah. uh, Wonderful experience. Brilliant. Um, so I'm sure Georgie Bist would have been one of the lads, you know, the, the amount of stories that uh, that uh, went on um, about him. He's lived a, a very big life. I think um, you would have uh, learnt a lot as a 16-year-old going out and in Manchester there. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, so... Um, Fantastic experience. You're 16 years old. You're playing in the, the B side there, the youth side. Um, you're getting instructions. You're learning a lot. Um, you could run. I, you know, I've, I've watched videos of you getting up and down the pitch. You you, you had an engine in you. So how did you, how did, how did you get that engine going, uh, Cole? I think a lot of it's got to do with... Uh... Uh, reading the play, knowing where to be, where to anticipate, uh, uh, and, and where to uh, find the open spaces. So you could be, uh, it was nothing like uh, someone to, uh, a, a good player to uh, pass you a 50, a 50 yard ball, you know, and cut out all of the, uh, the, the opposition, cut out so many players. And uh, if you find, found yourself in a, in a, in a gap, and a good player would know you'd be there and, and you'd be running up and back and up. That's probably why how I got so fit because you'd run up, you'd run 70 metres and you would, wouldn't get the ball. Then you had to run all the way back <laughs> again to your, to your defence position. And I, that's how I got a lot of fitness out of that, I think. And because uh, I was a bad trainer, I hated training. But when I got on the field, you, you just wanted to run all day. Okay. All right. 
And so you spent uh, you spent a, a little bit of time, um, obviously in the in the twos there at at, at Manchester. Uh, great learning experience. And then um, I think it was at sixty six you come back to Adamstown Rosebuds um, to to play first team football there. Yes, well, well, most of all, I wanted to go out, go over and, and break in to the to uh, and get a contract. Okay. And I finally got a contract. So Matt Busby called me into the office and said I was there five or six months, and he said we've decided to give you a twelve months contract, and okay. I was ecstatic. Mm-hmm. And then I went home and broke the news to to Ray and his mother. And Ray had been there two years and he decided that he wanted to come home. Because we both were very homesick, even though we had his mother there looking after us. So I just declined the offer because I didn't want to stay there by myself. And I'd have to go in digs, in the digs where I didn't know people. Today, the kids do it anyway because, uh, I don't know, it's a home away from home, but... Back then, the Vietnam War was really going and my mother was, was ill and I decided mm-hmm. to, to uh, knock it back and come home, which, which I am always think if I've done the right, did, did the right thing or not. So mm-hmm. in the end, I ended up coming back and ended up playing for me country anyway, but, yeah. uh, which was yeah. wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, I played 11 years on the roofs and... Uh, mm. I uh, loved every minute of it. Well, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a really interesting point, sort of the sliding doors um, where you, you're so close to your mate. Um, and obviously, Ray is one of the, the, one of the greatest soccer rooms to ever put on the shirt. Um, and because you wanted to be with your mate, um, and I, I take my hat off for, for you, so obviously it's a tough time to be by yourself. So that... that you know, nobody knows the loneliness of that, you know, being home, away from home and you're only a young lad. Um, so you've uh, decided to, to return to, the, to our country to play um, back here. So that's a really interesting story. Um, so um, it, uh, you, you, you come back, play, you come back to Newcastle and uh, keep on playing in the, in, at, for, for Adamstown. So, um, and, and, and Ray was obviously playing there as well. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we both started once we came back in 66, uh, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, we both played for Adamstown and uh, Manchester United toured that year. Yes. Uh, on their off season. And uh, I played against them in, in Newcastle Sports Ground uh, when they come out. But we stayed at, uh, we stayed at Adamstown. Ray only stayed for the year, for one year. Then he was, Hakoa come up and wanted both of us. Mm-hmm. And uh, they could only afford one. So as they would take the goal scorer, Ray, which... Ray never looked back, and uh, and uh, I was sad to see him go. I was uh, not that he got the chance to go, but uh, just because he'd be living in Sydney and and would be right away from each other. Yeah. And yeah, yeah so uh, and then it took me another five five years before I had the chance to go to Sydney because you had to play in Sydney to be recognised. Mm-hmm. Um, for the national side, and that yes. you know, they yes. never took many players from Newcastle, but I was picked from Newcastle. That's right. Me and John Doyle was picked on the 1970 World Tour, and Newcastle was a a, a breeding ground for internationals. Over the years, yep. there's been a lot of internationals come from the Newcastle district. Yes, yeah, so uh, I stayed with Ray Buds, and Ray Ray went and was very successful down with our colour. So, I mean, like you think about all the, the Newcastle boys, uh, to me, yourself, Ray, Craig Johnson, Marshall Sopo, just to name a few. Fantastic breeding ground, uh, that part of Australia, um, champions of our game. So, um, yeah, you, you, you first uh, got your Socceroo, uh your first cap in 1970, 
just before you you moved to to Marconi in seventy one. Uh, is that right, uh, Colt? Yeah, um, we were playing a grand final in uh, in Newcastle um, in September, I think it was, and uh, after the grand final, we got word that. And John Doyle also played for Adams Down that John Doyle and myself were picked in Rally Rasic's 1970 World Cup side to, uh, to tour the world uh, in November uh, that year. So uh, we went on a uh, six weeks tour of the world and around the world. And uh, it was a very tiresome, hard tour, that was. What does it feel like to uh, put on the, the green and gold and then get your first cap? What does it feel like? Well, you feel 10 foot tall for a start. Yes. To be picked, to be picked is just mind boggling. And when you put the first time you put the shirt on, you, you just, I'm going to go home and sleep in this. <laughs> just yeah. Like when you were a kid. You know, that's what you feel like doing because they don't come easily mm-hmm. and not everyone gets one, you know. So uh, mm-hmm. it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling to represent your country. And you you played over 30 times for our country and over a big breadth, right? So you your first cap and your last cap for the Socceroos um, spanned like almost a decade, Um so yeah. explain to me, Cole, why you didn't get more games because in, in that time, what was the story there? Well, I played 11 years for the Socceroos and only played 22 games. Uh, a internationals, that is. And that's only an average of two a year. But I was picked for every tour that went away, but unfortunately it was, uh, couldn't get away from work, Mm -hmm. Uh, couldn't afford to get away from work Mm -hmm. back in those Mm -hmm. days because the, I would, I would lose too much money. And, uh, Mm -hmm. but I was always asked to uh, go away. And at one stage in the, in the, for the 78 World Cup, Jimmy Shoulder was the coach at the time, and he had to ask Sir Arthur George to uh, ring my mine manager to see if that let me give me time off to go. Mm. And he agreed to it, to that one because I went away with the seventy eight for the preparing of the seventy eight World Cup. Mm. But that was about mm. the only time. A lot of the other times I just couldn't go because of lack of Lack of funds. Okay. That's a very important point. This is, we're talking about football in a different generation. This is obviously before I was born. Uh, born your first time you played. I was born in 76. You already played many times for the Socceroos. Um, but let everybody know what your job was, mate. I was, uh, I was working in the coal mine. Okay, there you uh, go. And uh, it was, it was a, Pretty hard job, uh, and there was, and you couldn't sort of leave. You, if you left your job, that would be men short, and uh, other men would get uh, cranky because they'd have to double up, and and uh, there was another reason why I didn't want to uh, upset the the crew, the team, as to speak, the group. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, well, I missed a lot of games, uh, which I regret, but it was, well, it was unfortunate. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's the life and the times, right? So, but I want everybody to think about that. You're spending a whole shift, right, digging coal, and then you go into training, or digging coal, and then putting on a soccer shirt. That's a tough life, mate. It's not easy, okay? Not everyone can do that. Think about right now... The players who play in our country, they, they, they just train, right? They, they're the full-time professionals, right? You spent hours and hours 
digging, right? Hauling it, moving it. That's a tough, tough job, mate. I'll take my hat off to you. This is a, this is, um, and people need to understand you could have played many more times, but you, you got, you boys didn't get paid like you did. You got a family to feed. You got kids to raise, right? You got to put bread on the table. Um, this is, it was a big sacrifice to go and play for our country because you give away that, you, you know, your you work doesn't pay you, all right, to go and play football. Um, you have to sacrifice that and, Whatever little money you get um, as your daily rate or whatever it was, the Socceroos would be a pittance compared to what you got paid in the weekly wage. Is that right, Colt? Yeah. Well, there's one example. Uh, our goalkeeper, Jimmy Fraser, uh, could not go. And I think Jimmy would have been the, the first pick goalkeeper, first choice. He had a business and he couldn't get anyone to look after his business. So he... He missed the World Cup over that, over not being able to get away from his job. So uh, there might have been a couple of other players that uh, may have said that too, and they weren't picked in the 24. But, uh, you know, everyone had jobs, and uh, it was it was pretty hard, in the, pretty hard in those days, yeah. Yeah. So... Um... We're going we're gonna to tell me about... Uh, tell me about the boss, mate. So tell me about... What's what we was like um, being coached by Rally? Um... Yes, well, Rally was uh, what was the expression. It was it was hard mm. but firm, and hard and firm he was, and uh, he, he never let you know how you were going unless you were. Uh, your game was slipping a little bit. He'd come and he, once he'd come, he had a word in my ear. And it was just nothing, uh, nothing cranky about him. He just said uh, something about you, uh, your, uh, your game's uh, slipping a little bit, uh, saying that you never had such a good game today. Uh, Harry's, Harry Williams is... You'd mention Harry's name, and I knew <laughs> Harry played my position. I, and then I thought, well, I better do something about it because he wouldn't blow you up or anything after a game, and that he just speak to you quietly and just let you know, yeah. which was good in a way because no one liked being balled out in front of the rest of the team, mm. and that you know. But uh, yeah, so uh, he just let you know in a way, but so, yeah. It, so to you, he just quietly mentioned, uh, look, I've got Harry Williams over here, just in case it's not working out for you, Cole. Harry, Harry's got your more job. More or less to say, more or less to say that uh, <laughs> um, you missed the tackle today or you missed this or you've done something. You shouldn't have been your game slipping a bit. Yeah. Uh, as you do, you, you might get a, bit, a little bit uh, overconfident, you know, yeah. when yep. you're playing. And yeah. You've got to be brought back into line and... Uh, Really had that way of telling you, and he had the uh, the other time he had the way of getting an extra fifteen percent out of you. Okay. With uh, he'd praise you up, well, not to your face, but in the squad, in the in the team meetings, and that and he'd give you a boost that way. Okay. But, uh, he was a very good. He was a very very good coach. Uh, we didn't like him after a game at five o'clock the next morning, though, when we played a game, he would. He would ring everyone in the in the hotel to get up and get out in the foyer for the training for half an hour. <laughs> so it, that's hilarious. So people need to understand: no recovery session, no like massages, massages. He's calling you up five in the morning and saying, "Boys, let's go. We're going for we're going for a trot." Is that right? That is exactly correct. And. Uh, Everywhere we were after we played a game, we got used to it. But uh, we didn't like it because we knew we were going to go, and you, you'd always have a restless night. <laughs> yeah. That's unbelievable. So, it you, was a bugger for that things like that. So he'd work you so hard. You play a game the very next day. You're, you're out working, uh, no rest on your bike. Let's go. 
Um, all right, so we're going to now talk about some of the, the lead-up games um, to the 74 World Cup uh, in 1974. In, in April, you boys played down uh, the first game. Um, I'm pretty sure it was at Olympic Park. Um, you played Uruguay. Um, you were selected in that side. It was uh, yeah. nil, nil, nil in um, in uh, in uh, in April. Um, so you know, Jack Riley's in goal. Doug, uh, Genovich, uh, Peter Wilson, Manfred Schaefer, uh, yourself uh, with a backline. Um, Jimmy BK, Ray Richards, Jimmy Rooney, Ray Bartz, um, and uh, Gary Manuel and uh, Branko Buljevic uh, uh, were the 11. Um, and um, you boys held uh, Uruguay, who were pretty strong uh, uh, side, uh, nil-nil in, um, in Melbourne. Uh, what was that game like, mate? Yeah, well, we, we, uh, we had two games to play against Uruguay in Australia. They were on their way to the, uh, to the World Cup. Mm. They were touring before they went to Germany and we had, a, had the game in Melbourne and we were really excited and frightened really because Uruguay, look, they're, oh. a, they're, they've won the World Cup once, I think. Mm -hmm. They're always a pretty... Yeah. Good side, and we thought we we would we would uh, have a, our work cut out, mm. which 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 we did in a way. But then we through the game we started to get a little bit confident because we were attacking and they were attacking, and and the and the teams seemed uh, on a level par. Mm. So mm. it was a hard game, and. Uh, you didn't know who you were playing against, and, and that, and, uh, but it, it was a it was a hard game and a, a spiteful game, mm. as I remember. Mm. And uh, we ended up nil all draw, and and uh, it was a bit of a feather in our cap okay. for mm. the next game. So, so we, we we played the draw, and that and, and Melbourne, that was that. I, I want to I ask you something. Um, you said it was a spiteful game. They, were they a little bit dirty? They were a lot dirty. It, uh, they're, they're a team that could give it but couldn't take it. Mm. And uh, I think the goalkeeper got hurt. I, and I think that's how it, the next match was a very spiteful match in Sydney. But uh, I think they, they started the to dish the, the fouls out and that in the next game. And uh, it got pretty rough. In so, so, yeah, it, it's like in April again. So it's only a couple of days after, you know, you've held the nil-nil draw. You end up winning uh, that, that game 2-0 in Sydney. Obviously, um, uh, the uh, Ray Bart scored a goal and, and Peter Alton... Um, just before um, the end of the game, uh, bagged one. So from from memory, um, Ray got injured in, in that um, game. Is that right? Yeah, uh, Ray scored a screamer from twenty five yards out, uh, and we went to a lead of one nil. And shortly after, we had a corner and. Uh, Ray was in the penalty box and uh, the corner come across and the bloke, one of the players, just went up and chopped him in the throat. Mm. And there was a big skirmish, skirmish and uh, the players, the Uruguayan players got the player that did it because the referee called him out and the players got all around him and, and huddled him so you couldn't see. And then he come out of the huddle and... His mouth was all bleeding. And uh, the referee was Donald Campbell from Adelaide. And uh, he sent the bloke off. With the, and, the, and the players are saying, no, he's bleeding. Ray Bart's hit him. And he, Ray didn't hit him. He, he hit Ray and then the players got him. And one of them thumped him in the mouth to make his face bleed. But the referee seen seen the decision and, uh, and sent him off. 
Yes. And in the meantime, uh, the next day, Ray woke up and half his side was paralysed. Yeah. But yeah. during the game, uh, it was on in the game. It was They were kicking and pushing. And we give it back, of course. And, uh, and the next day, I was supposed to play uh, with my club, Western Suburbs, and Les Schoenfug was a coach. And I got to the ground and he said, how are you feeling? Okay, you get changed. And I got started to get changed. I took my shirt off and he said, oh, put your shirt back on. So I said, why? He said, look at your back. I had stud marks all over me back from where you had a tackle and fell down and they kicked you in the back and things like that. Uh, How dirty. As you're you're playing, you don't feel things like that because your adrenaline's pumping and you're winning. So So you just... It's important that people know this is not not today with plastic studs. You boys were were aluminium studs back then and they weren't... They were you could cut skin with those studs. Tell tell us about your boots in the seventies. What was the it was metal aluminium studs? Yes, yes. Well, um, they were aluminium aluminium studs, mm. and uh, they were an inch long. I don't know whether that is in centimeters, but an inch long is uh, it's a good size, and uh, uh, they could make a hole in your leg. Yep. Uh, and uh, and uh, if your player went over the ball into your shins, we never wore shin pads. Yep. Like then the rules come out later on that everyone must wear shin pads. But uh, anyway, there was a bit of a tussle after the game. There was a bit of a uh, their players attacked our out their bench attacked our players bench, and uh, <laughs> it was on for young and old. And, uh, yeah, dirty, dirty Uruguayan. As, so. as as I can remember. Uh, Later on in the first game of the World Cup, they had two players sent off. Mm. Uh, I don't know who they played, Holland yeah. or someone. Uh, mm. but, uh, they were, well, you know, the Uruguayans, I might sound good, but they were filthy, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, not good. And obviously that, that affected our, uh, you know, maybe our, our best player um, was then eliminated uh, from our... Uh, World Cup campaign. So uh, this is the sort of the sliding doors that we talk about. So you 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 guys jump over to um, uh, you end up going to play a couple of friendlies. Um, you uh, head across. Um, I think your stops were uh, in Indonesia and then in uh, Tel Aviv. Is that right? So before you go to Germany, you're making two stops uh, to play a, a couple of games. The first game. Um, was against um, Indonesia. Is that right? Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we uh, we played the first game in Indonesia. Uh, played their national side, and we only won two one. Mm. And uh, well, I scored the scored a goal, and Rally was uh, going to experiment. Meant me playing in the midfield. He wanted to see how I went in midfield, and as it was, I. I went all right, but I uh, I done me knee in that game, mm. so I never played or never trained for the next four weeks. Mm. As I was in uh, uh, Israel, uh, swimming every day and doing exercises every day with with Doc Corrigan and Peter Van Rin, mm. um, while the other boys were training, I was in the the uh, Olympic pool. Uh, Trying to fix the right. So the um, that tell us about the goal that you scored because you haven't scored you didn't score too many goals but uh, you got one that day. Ah um, well, as 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 we were playing with, uh, we had a corner kick and I was in the box and uh, I just happened to move, come to me and I headed and went in and I'm only I'm not a tall man but uh, I got the shock on me life. But uh, happy days. Uh, it was a goal. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, hits, hits I the never head. Got the chance. Mate, it hits the head, goes in, claim it, claim it. <laughs> uh, brilliant. And uh, in front of a big crowd, uh, over 60,000 people, uh, I'm sure not too many scream for the Socceroos. So, um, nah, yeah. nah that's funny, you know, when you go away, um, when you go away and play, there's no supporters for you. Mm. But if whoever comes and plays in Australia, They've always got supporters, mm. and uh, and I'm, I'm thinking back to the 
the games in uh, Iran where there's a hundred, we had a hundred and two thousand, and no supporters whatsoever. Mm. It's just frightening. It's yeah. so frightening. It's you can't talk to each other on the field. You can't hear. Mm. It's mm. it's and it's so hard to play. Mm. But anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah we so had sixty thousand cool. at that game and uh, yeah. in Indonesia. And uh, the um, you know eleven boys against the world. I love it. Um, so, and and uh, you guys, uh, you guys get across to um, to Tel Aviv. Um, so, tell me about uh, how often you would train. Like, I know you, you've gotten injured, but before before this time, how often would would, would rally make you boys uh, train in camp? Oh, every day was twice a day. Sometimes three times a day. Mm-hmm. All you were doing was going from the hotel to the ground and back and lunch and 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 that, you know. But uh, at least two times a day, sometimes three. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to do a bit extra sprints and stuff like that, but no one no one minded because uh, no one seemed to mind because uh, it got a bit boring sitting in your rooms all the time and and that, you know. So it was it was good to get out and 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 the. Training was hard at times, but then he had some good training. Like, and the boys like to to, to play shoot ins and all the fours and that. You know, they like to do that. And the defenders like just like to kick the ball from halfway, and sort of hit the crossbar. Just just gives a bit of free time on the yeah in some yeah. training sessions. You know, so. and, and and who who was your roomie um, in in most of the camps? Who'd you room with? Oh, I I'd, I I'd room with Harry Harry Williams. Uh, Great blow. Uh, on the World Cup, I room with uh, Dougie, Dougie Yusenovich. Great player. And uh, and uh, room with Johnny on the uh, game to Iran, one game to Iran uh, for a week. And uh, uh, all great blokes, all great blokes. You know? hey, so, so Johnny, Johnny apparently was a big bookworm. Is that he kept to himself? Is that right in the in the room? Yeah, Johnny, he, he, he was friendly enough. John was yeah. a great bloke, but he, he kept himself because he was doing a lot of studying. Okay. And for, uh, I think, for the, his TV job and all that, and he was always reading, learning. Yeah. And that, you know, very quiet bloke, but a good, passionate. He was very passionate. But, uh, he loved his fellow man. He, yes. You know, he loved his fellow man. He uh, yes. you know, great leader. Great, and, uh, great bloke. And a, and a great um, and a great advocate of multicultural Australia. So he really wanted to make sure that that all uh, migrant communities that came in um, were, were were part of this country. And I think that's a great testament to his legacy. Um, and uh, you, you roomed with Doug. The conversation would have been brilliant with Doug. I'm sure you would have been really talkative. How was it going on? How was the conversation with Dougie? Uh, Dougie was good. Dougie, Dougie he uh, he couldn't get over how uh, passionate I was about my country, you know. Yep. <laughs> and he'd tell people, he'd say, "This bloke is the most passionate bloke I've I've ever seen." And Dougie was like a Scotsman. Sometimes you had to ask him twice to say, ask him what he said. <laughs> he said, "Oh, I got Scots friends, and I still got to ask them. They've been here sixty years, and you still got to ask." What they say. He was hard to understand, Doug. Okay. Yeah, that's brilliant. What a lovely man. <laughs> He's a lovely bloke. Okay. All right. So now you guys you guys are in Germany. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's June um, in Germany. What's it like, mate, um, to be finally... You, what people don't understand, you guys made the last 16. This is not like now it's 32 right? You've got, to, you've got to progress from the group stage to get what, where you guys are. You're the champions. You're already you're the champions of Asia, right? Um, you, 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 you're, you're, you've made the last 16 um, in the world. Um, and you're playing, uh, uh, you know, I think, I wouldn't say the group of death, but you had a pretty tough draw, right? You've got East Germany, West Germany, and Chile, right? So on paper, I'm sorry, Right on paper, you got one of the weaker sides. You look at the, the two German sides on paper, they're a lot, lot stronger. And uh, the Chilean side, okay, maybe they're on 
let's say, on paper, on par with us, okay? Um, so what does it feel like? You're now in Germany. You're, you're at the world stage. Um, what were the people like? Yeah, well, first of all, you talk about the last 16. And, and when I was young, I thought, fancy playing in a World Cup, it's something you dream of, you know? And there are only 16 teams in the World Cup. And, and that night in Hong Kong, when we qualified, I was dumbfounded for, for ages. I just couldn't believe that we, we had made it. It was unbelievable. But anyway, we finally got there and um, we settled in our headquarters. We come from Switzerland and we were in Switzerland for two weeks and we come to our headquarters in uh, Hamburg, which was Hamburg SV's headquarters. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe my eyes for the uh, for the facilities they had there. The, uh, uh, the mo it was motel. It was like a great big hotel motel with. They had nine full size soccer fields, swimming pools, tennis courts, everything that opened and shut. Us. And plus the guards with the machine guns and dogs, yes. Alsatian dogs, yes. after the other business. In, 72. Yes. Yes, and, and uh, we were in a, a great place to, to, to be uh, roomed at and uh, at our headquarters at. It was wonderful there. But we knew we had a task ahead of us. Um, and Raleigh was very concerned about the East Germans mm. team because he, he went and watched them train and watch their facilities and and that he said they're unbelievable how they train their facilities they've got and all that and we're just we're just uh, we're just Australian workers here to uh, mm. but uh, as it went we had West uh, East Germany to play first and mm. and <clears throat> we could see they were fit when we started playing and uh, I think they could have played another two or three games after they played us. Wow. So they were so fit. So, but we we done a good job for 75, 80 minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, what was the message? What was the message before the game? That what what was Raleigh saying before the game? Um, what 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 did he say? You know, you 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 play your first game of the World Cup. What was the overall message? Well, just play your own game mainly, and he'd say the uh, uh, it's only man against man, but you've got to watch that Sparwasser. I think his name was. Uh, yeah. He was uh, one of the one of the good forwards, but he was he was quiet. He was very quiet, and uh, as I said before, once once we uh, got our second wind, and and that we feel like that we. We're doing all right here. We, you know, it was, but it was, you wouldn't didn't, didn't want to make a mistake because so uh, you yeah. knew they'd pounce on you and yeah and that you know but, uh, we held okay. we held held them yeah you held them so you, you go into half time what's the message you nil nil um what, you, obviously you must feel good right you've held East Germany uh, for forty five um, you know we've had a couple of they've had cut chances but we we've, we've we've also done. Uh, well to on the counter. Um, what's the message that Raleigh's saying to the boys at half time? Well, as more or less just so, as they're doing all right, playing uh, just play your game. Take the game to them. Yep. Don't sit back and wait. Just take the game to them and uh, uh, you know, just play the game as you normally play any other game. It's uh, yeah. and it's yeah. just a matter of time before something happens. Yeah, so and it, it did happen. No. Yeah, so the, the, the thing is, the thing is, you know, when I watch back that game, you know, the, the times that I've seen it, and you were quick. Yeah, every time I watch you run, you know, because you were hurling back. Um, and anyone who's played the game, it's happened to them, right? So only, not this year, last year, one mm. came off me and, and, and went in. You know, the ball's played across and you're, 
you're running back so fast and you slide and you kick the ball. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, that you would have sent that to Mars, that ball. Um, so, um, but unfortunately, you know, that, that was, uh, that was the one nil. Um, what was your, when you, when you're hurling back, cause they, they, they broke us, right? So they broke us down, uh, on the left hand side and they, the shot across. Um, what, what are you thinking when you're sprinting back? Well, first of all, I don't like, I don't trust the offside trap uh -huh. a lot. Mm. And I was out, I was at, well, we're all out, uh, 20 metres from the, from the goal line. Mm. And uh, I, I don't know what happened, but all I can remember is, is someone put a through ball and it went through the middle, through, the, through between Manfred and uh, Peter, a good hard through ball, and Jack, and, it, and Jack was out on the, nearly the 18-yard line and it went under him. And I could see that, so I I knew I had to get back mm. to the to to get it off the line. But my foot got tangled up in the post, the goal post, and I couldn't get a swing mm. on the ball. But uh, I know, as you said, I can remember I run like the wind for that twenty metres because I didn't trust the offside trap, mm. and I don't know whether he would have blew offside or not. So that's why I, I run back after the ball was kicked. Yeah. Maybe it was my yeah. fault that kept them on side, but we're out far enough. Mm. But that's something that... Yeah, this uh, is, a, this is yeah. football. Yeah, so... It's football. The, I could have they, been like the bloke in the one of the World Cups, the South African bloke, he scored two in the one half. Yeah, so the... Uh, the, the in America, I think it was. The, yeah, one, one, one in your career is bad enough. Yeah, no, look, this is... Um, it happens to it happens to the best of us, right? So um, it's it's not about about that. Uh, you're trying to clear the ball, and every time I say, like even when it came off your foot, I would, have, I would have, nine times out of ten you do that again. You'll send the ball, like I said, to Mars, right? Um, and but uh, anyway, we, we held them to to to, to two great game. I think um, the commentator at the end of the game uh, complimented. Um, that we've come to play and we've done a very respectable uh, job. Um, yeah, I, I remember that, watched that game a couple of times and the, I think his name was John Motson, the, the English uh, broadcaster, and he was so full of praise yes. for us on that, uh, on that game. And, I, I, he, and he kept on, where do they get these players from? Because mm. I got, kept getting knocked up and down, up and down and down and up. Because uh, they were a hard side, uh, East Germany. Very hard, physical. Yeah. But, uh, and it, you, then you play the might of um, West Germany. And you think about this, this, um, you know, Bertie Vox, uh, um, you know, Jerb uh, Werner, um, fantastic Franz Beckenbauer. You know, we're talking about um, legends, you know, all-time legends, right? And you're... You boys, you part timers are good at playing, right? So, I know um, uh, for me, they had the strongest team in in the group. I know Raleigh might have said they're worried about the East Germans, but the West Germans they were just uh, first class, and and the goals that they uh, scored, they 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 pinged a couple early. I think um, over at Stuck scored one in the first ten or fifteen minutes. Um, so they, they got off to a really good start. It would have been would have been tough against them. Um, and um, over a big crowd as well in West, uh, playing against West Germans, over fifty thousand uh, screaming West Germans. Um, that would have been tough playing against them. Yes, well, they did win the World Cup, and it is they are the best team I've ever 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 played against. They were so good everywhere on the park. They were, they, you, you think you had them closed down, you think you were going to win the ball and they had options everywhere. They were, they were brilliant. And, and it's only, you know, you can, there's only other, one other country in the world that I've ever seen as good as that, and that's Brazil. Like Johnny used to say years ago, 
back in the 50s and the 60s, Brazil could have played without a goalkeeper. Okay. You know? Uh, they were that good. But this West German side, they were, they were absolutely marvellous. And uh, I'll never forget playing against a team that was so good in my lifetime. They were absolutely brilliant. But again, fantastic result. Um, I think, but uh, they were just that they they they, they were too good. Okay, um, and obviously, uh, you know, respect where where it's uh, where it's due. But it, against Chile, um, I think um, I think uh, the result. We all know the result was nil nil. But I think you boys had the better of them. Um, how did it feel against that that Chilean side in the last game? Did you feel like you could get the points there? I thought we could have. I thought I thought we would have. Mm. Um, uh, as the game went on, we thought uh, these these blokes are not as skillful as the other two teams we've played, mm. and we could win this. And I can remember crossing the ball to. And Jimmy McCoy headed it. He headed it a foot off the goal line and it bounced over the bar. Mm. And normally they say when you head a ball, head it down. So, it, but it, the ground was that hard. Although we had all that rain, the ground was rock rock hard, and it hit the ground and bounced over the the crossbar. We couldn't believe it, and we had a lot of other chances yeah. in that game, and and. We were very unlucky. Well, we got a point. But we were very unlucky not to get get the win there. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, what people don't understand is um, we finished thirteenth out of uh, that. So um, there were there were uh, it was either thirteenth or fourteenth uh, in terms of the the standings. The, if you take goal difference and all that sort of stuff yeah. Yeah. Um, in the world. Okay, we finished, the, we were the 13th best side in 1974 in the world. So, uh, an absolute fantastic achievement. Um, exactly, yeah. That's so much a, some, some sort of achievement anyway for uh, all the hard work that was put into and, uh, and the years, the few years that uh, was put into it. It was a good achievement, really. You guys done, did a, a, a fan, I think, a, a fantastic uh, effort, the, the games. Um, tell me what's it like um, when you hear the national anthem, um, Cole. Um, you're standing there and you hear a national anthem play. What does it feel well, like? Tears in the eyes. Okay. Tears in the eyes. That's, uh, and your chest is out, stuck out. And uh, everyone sang it, mm. which I was so pleased to see. You know, every player sang it with their with their whole heart. You know, and uh, it's as you say, it's uh, these things don't come along all the time. These uh, representing your countries, and it's uh, you work hard for it, and you uh, cherish it. And, yes. Uh, I still, I'm still getting letters from people overseas that collect cards of like, footballers. The last ten years, I've been getting more and more and people from the uh, European countries send me half a dozen photographs to sign, to send back, and you know I think, and I've got a friend in Hong Kong that that just happened out the blue and he. he he coaches, he teach, he's a teacher and he teaches children. And they send me a Christmas card every year with, and that, and I send them something nice back. You know, they're just so many people that love the game. And, yeah. uh, and, and it's not hard to, uh, it's not hard to send things back and say hello to someone, you know, and then they got out the way to, to talk to you or to see you. And uh, it's just a wonderful achievement. And I'll never forget it. And um, away from your country, no yeah. matter what people think, it, uh, you'll never, you never forget it. It's just wonderful. It's brilliant. And you boys have uh, sort of stuck together. This '74 side, every every year. I mean, rally tries to keep all the lads together. Um, what's that been like ever since the 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 the, 
um, the 74 World Cup, you guys have sort of tried to, um, you, you, mates. Yeah, well, we are. We, uh, we're all mates. We're all like one big family. Uh, we we uh, go to Johnny Warren Golf Day. A lot of blokes go there. We do have reunions every now and then. And uh, uh, we see, and that brings more players along that never play for the country, but old, old, older players that uh, that have played for clubs and you, you played against and you, and you know, it's, it's great to see them. But uh, as far as rally rings, rings uh, plays, he rings me every three or four months just to see how I'm going and uh, how I'm doing, health-wise and everything. And uh, yeah. rings Ray and and uh, and then we catch up with uh, the other mates and uh, down at Johnny Warren Golf Day. And we haven't had a reunion for a while, but it's uh, about time uh, we organise one. Yeah. Another one. Brilliant. Um, so it's uh, it's a testimony on um, what kind of mateship um, you boys had and and how uh, sort of sort of the brotherhood um, of that seventy four side. And obviously, we know it took us a long time to compete in another World Cup. Um, but yeah, you boys, you did us really proud. Um, and um, yeah. You, you made history, mate. You made history. Um, so, yeah, what he did. Um, uh, so what was your, does it feel like yesterday? Like you, you're thinking back. Yeah. Does it feel like it was like you, you know, you just, you're back in, um, you're thinking about games. We're talking about 74, um, you know, 40, 46 years ago uh, now. Um, does it feel like you click back and you, you, you're there, you're remembering sprinting back for that goal or playing against Chile or Germany or the, the studs in the back of the Uruguayans that you're on the, on the... Does it feel like yesterday? It certainly does, Sasha. I can remember I can remember it just like yesterday. Every game, the yeah. whole three, and all through the tournament. And uh, every time I've played, even the World Tour, yeah. uh, I can remember that. Those games, and uh, uh, at least you know you've got them in your mind. You'll never lose them. You'll you'll never lose your photographs, or or that you might lose them. But the rest is in your mind, and you you can still see it. Great, uh, it's good uh, to have. Uh, oh, this is brilliant, and um, so obviously um, a fantastic uh, career. Um, all across Australia, you, 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 after the 74, um, you, you, you had a number of years at uh, Western Suburbs, probably, would you say they were one of the bigger clubs in Sydney? Not the, not the biggest. Okay. We only had a, a, a home crowd of uh, a thousand. Okay. But if we played Panhellenic or uh, ethnic club, Croatia, would get five or six thousand. Of course, the uh, yeah. the Greeks and that would travel. Yeah. But our home our home base was only about a thousand people. And, uh, but they were very very good club, very yeah. good club, very professional. Uh, I liked. I really liked it. They offered me three or four years. I had there. Yeah. And then and then um, after that, uh, you obviously you went uh, you, you you left Sydney and back into Newcastle. Um, and you finished up your career um, back at New, playing at, in Newcastle. Is that right? Yeah, well, the National League started in 77 or 78 when I was playing for West, and I had a year there, and then uh, Newcastle got into the second year. They were, they were allowed in, and uh, I went back to Newcastle and played till about 81, 82 there. Yeah. Before I finished, and, and we had an average crowd of thirteen and a half thousand at Newcastle. It's, Newcastle was a soccer city and a league city. Yeah, and uh, I can remember the uh, we played Panhellenic or Sydney Olympic at the uh, in Newcastle, and and in five kilometres away, the British Lions played 
Newcastle in the Rugby League on the same day. Mm. And we had 18,300 and they had uh, 5,000 at the league. But now it's reversed now. The league gets gets the big crowds now and the soccer gets the smaller crowds. And they're mm. still up to about eight or 10,000. But uh, it's a soccer city, uh, Newcastle, and uh, there should be more in, more internationals coming from at, from this area, and there's not. That's mm. a bit worrying, really. Yeah, obviously, uh, we won't we won't comment too much. Obviously, we're, we're filmed. We're, we're, today's the the thirty first of October, uh, twenty twenty, and um, Newcastle. Um, in some strife for what's happening, you know, the, the ownership, et cetera, in the A-League. Um, and, you know, my, my thoughts are, uh, with the club and I, my suggestion is go back to your roots. There's a lot of young um, Nova Castrians there, play the boys. There's plenty of people that would, would I'm sure that would um, be happy to give their wisdom and help. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, um, People in Newcastle that you know, if they were asked, they would you know happily share their wisdom. So, um, but um, I, um, what are your? Would you would you like to comment on on, um, on what's going on now in the, the Newcastle side uh, in the in the current uh, A League? No, not really. I, I, it's a shame. I, I follow it. It's a shame. That it's it's gone like this. This is another time. It's 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 gone like this a couple of times before. Mm. And uh, if someone don't buy them, I think they they'll, they'll never get back in again. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, look. So the talk is the talk is if if they can't get a buy, they they and they go out, mm. they'll never get back in again. Which is a well, shame because they've got to have it. The the the, the amount of juniors up here. It's unbelievable. Yes. And, and the, the boys from that region need a pathway for success, just like you had a pathway, right? So you had that, that pathway uh, to success to represent the national team. The young boys in Newcastle need a pathway as well. So um, we want we want the next uh, Ray Bartz, uh, the next Cole Curran, the next Marshall Soper, the next Craig Johnson to have that pathway um, to, to play junior ranks and then go on to begin better things. And I think that's why it's so important um, to have uh, a team in Newcastle uh, strong um, and not just yeah. down the bottom, but um, a strong team. So um, talk to me about um, your greatest um, memory as a soccer room. Well, the greatest one would have to be... In in Hong Kong, where we qualified, uh, to see that ball go after, it was such a hard game, and to see that ball go in the net, and there was still 20 minutes to go, or something like that. How in the hell are we going to hold out? But it was such a feeling that you, you'd you only have to have to, 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 to feel it, to realise what it's like. And... Uh, after the whistle blow for full time, it, it was just bedlam on the field with the players in, in uh, ecstasy, actually. <laughs> so, really. for people who don't know, let's rewind. So, we're playing, I think, the, the Koreans, yeah? So, we've, we've, we've played two games against the Koreans and we've ended up in a, in a draw, right? So, effectively, away goals don't count as two. So, um, like now on these rules, we'd qualify. But back then... Uh, goal was a goal. It didn't matter where he was. So you went to play for a third game, yes, in Hong Kong? Yes. Well, as it started, we had the first game in Sydney and the old uh, number two sports ground, uh, which we drew nil all. Yep. And the next week we flew over to Korea and uh, when we started the game, before we knew it, we were two nil down. 2-0, yes. At half time. Yes. yes, at half time. Then we really got into it was at half time and said, you know, you're Australian, you never give up. Mm-hmm. 
along them lines. Yep. He was telling us along, you know, and as we never give up and preaching and talking along them ways. And we went out and we we scored two goals in the second half to create the draw. Yep. Which meant that we had to play the extra game back in those days, which was in the next week in Korea. In, in Hong Kong. Kong. Yep. Against Korea. So, and, it, well, you know, it was a pretty, pretty long, drawn-out uh, time. And as we just talked about the feeling of winning in Hong Kong was just jubilant. It was just so, but you guys, you guys felt like you'd won that game, even though it was two-two. It was a good feeling on the plane coming over, right? So, so tell us about that because the, you know, it, the, those boys, the Korean boys, were two 0 up, and, and by rights they should have, they probably should have uh, let us exit the tournament. But Aussie spirit rally reads you the riot act at halftime, and you go out there and you, you try and give them help, and uh, we get two goals back. Um, but it's the momentum has shifted, it's sort of like a win. You, you know those games where you draw, but you know that it feels like you've won because you. you ne- is that how yeah. it felt? Yes, well, that's right. Uh, Sasha, really, after we played the two all draw in uh, in Korea, we were pretty confident from then mm. till we finished the game in Hong Kong because even when we started the game in Hong Kong. We were confident because of the way we left the last game, mm. we were getting on top, and that's how it that's how it panned out. So it and, was lucky. And lucky. Tell, tell me about that goal because I think right that is the best goal that any Australian side has scored. And I know um, there's been a different goal that got rated as the best goal, but for me, when that ball left Jimmy's boot and Ooh, it went in the net. Like I think it was like from twenty-five or thirty yards. It was a pinger. Um, it was all the minute it left his boot. It was going in. What did that feel like when that goal went in? Well, yes, uh, you could tell from the moment it left his foot that it was going in. He just hit it. At the right time, the right place, and the ball had sort of hit the net and bounced back out before the goalkeeper noticed it. And uh, it it was a classic. It was I don't know, twenty five yards out, something like that. Yeah. Uh, a long way. Yeah. Hit through defenders, and 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 that you know it's uh, a long way out and. Uh, a smashing goal. What it was? It have to go up as a, as one of the greatest. That would a brilliant oh. goal. And, Jimmy Rooney uh, passed it, and uh, all you boys ran. If I rem- remember the footage, you, everybody ran to celebrate and jumped on top of him. Is like unbelievable. You mean Ellie Smother thing? <laughs> <laughs> the um. So. Uh, and, and you would say that that game was your greatest sort of, uh, it was a, the greatest feeling playing as a soccer room. Exactly, yeah. Knowing that you're so close and so far away from a World Cup mm. and to finally get there and to know you, you've got there and, and won the game and got there, it's, that's it. That's the living end. That's the, the greatest feeling of all. Wow. Uh, so uh, I bet you you boys celebrated that night. Well, that's actually we did, and uh, I had the flu at the time, and uh, I had a pretty early night. Uh, okay. I had a few beers, and I just couldn't keep my head up. Okay. I was just had the flu. I was pretty crook. Me and Jimmy Rooney were both crook. We played, and as I said, I'm, I never said anything to the rally because he might have put me out. <laughs> I could play with a flu. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, look, Cole, um, this has been an absolute pleasure reliving uh, your moments. And I felt like, I mean, this is before I was born, but I feel like by speaking with you, um, that I'll, you know, you've made me feel like I'll, a, a part of the dressing room. And I hope. 
everybody who gets to, to see this also feels the passion that, that, uh, that you boys had um, and that, that feeling of being Australian and representing our, our country, being a socceroo. Um, you've given us all so much joy to celebrate through the history book. So um, I want to thank you, sir, uh, Bunny, um, for, for um, giving us this your time and your wisdom and uh, for loving our great game. My pleasure, Sasha. And we're, we're all from different walks of life, but we're all, we're all, we were all family and we still are. And that's how everyone will, will tell you. So thank you very much for the interview. Uh, thanks for thinking of me. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you, sir. And it's been, like I said, an absolute pleasure. And, um, you know, the, the great Cole Curran. So thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure, Sasha. Thank you. All the best.